And here we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ocean County Historical Society's Temporarily Virtual Speaker Series. We were considering moving these back to our historic house museum in Tom's River, but due to the recent surge, <laughs> these lectures will remain online for the foreseeable future. Thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Melissa Ziobro, and I am a trustee of the Historical Society. I happen to be hosting these talks for now while they are online, but a lot of people help out with the logistics. So let me thank our president, Dr. Jeffrey Schenker, and other trustees who make these events possible, especially Barbara Roish and Richard and Mickey Kuntz. Uh, Dr. Schenker or Barb, anything else before I make some announcements? <laughs> now go right ahead. I'll keep uh, I just wanted ahead. to say one thing, if I may. <laughs> I believe, uh, do we have some High School South uh, History Club members, our History Club members with us today? Yes, Matt? They may have themselves muted, so. <laughs> okay, I believe, because I saw some before, but I okay. just want them to know uh, we're, they're very welcome and um, it's really glad to have them with us. Sorry, Melissa, all yours. Yeah, no, no, that's great. Love having the students with us. So just a few housekeeping announcements before we dive into today's program. Please note that today's program is being recorded and will be available for playback on our YouTube channel in case you're more comfortable keeping your camera off or anything like that. Today's speaker series, like so many of our events, is free, but we do rely on your donations to keep us going and to continue our mission, telling the stories of Ocean County. So we'd like you to know that you can donate from the safety and convenience of your own home via our website, oceancountyhistory.org. You can also sign up to be a member there. Perks include our award-winning newsletter, early registration and discounts on some programs, and more. It's all outlined on our website. Please know that we are open, both the Museum and Research Center. You can find all necessary information on our website too. We're currently by appointment, but as I noted, all of that is outlined on the website. I'd also like to remind you that we are on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Please follow us on the platform of your choice or on all. A little bit about our upcoming events. Um, I noted Barbara before, she's been very busy. She's got like more than a year planned out. <laughs> but I'll just preview two for you. February 13th, we'll have John Barrows speaking on land pirates at Barnegat. And on March 20th, Ron Post talking about the history of Cranberry Inlet. Again, there's more information on our website for anyone who would like it. With all that, on to today's event. With us today, we have Ralph E. Hunter Sr., who is the founder of the African American Museum in Atlantic City in Newtonville, New Jersey. Ralph has witnessed the changing Atlantic City cultural scene and added his personal collection of memorabilia to a museum there that showcases more than 1,000 graphics, drawings, paintings, and artifacts on a rotating basis. So after Mr. Hunter speaks, we will then have Q&A. Any questions for me before we start? Okay, well, then I will hand it over to you, Mr. Hunter. Well, on my screen right now, it says this meeting is being recorded. Should I touch anything there or just? No, just... sir. You just pretend that's not even there. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Just check. Well, hello. My name is Ralph Hunter. I'm the president and founder of the African American Heritage Museum of Southern New Jersey. Uh, the museum was a, got founded some 20 years ago. Uh, prior to finding the museum, I was a businessman and I was in retail and I had retail locations in places like uh, the Cherry Hill Mall, the Morristown Mall, Plymouth Meeting Mall, Deprit Mall, uh, and malls throughout New Jersey. And the nature of my business was uh, I was a forerunner of the head shop. Uh, that's what people called it later on. But um, what Spencer Gifts was doing um, back in the 50s and the 60s, they were selling a lot of mail order business. And I came up with the concept of not doing mail order, but having a store that resembled Spencer Gifts. And uh, the um, Cost Plus was a company I worked for in California. And I was in the export import business. So um, places like Pier One, if you can imagine, Pier one Spencer gift today 
and imagine what the precursor of that was, and that was me. So um, at that point in time, I was bringing in wicker furniture, wicker uh, hanging chairs. I was bringing in all kinds of things from the Middle East. I was a buyer for a company that I traveled to India, to China, and places of that nature. And in doing so, I found all these unique items, and I decided to turn them into a retail establishment. So I opened the very first store in Cherry Hill Mall. It was called a shop called East. And after a shop called East, we opened a company called the Ginza. And the Ginza shop was located in, in the Morristown Mall, as well as Long Beach Island. We had a place, of course, in Brent Beach. We had places down in Wildwood, New Jersey. So we had summer businesses that where we sold uh, these wonderful t-shirts and these uh, antique and wicker furniture, as well as clothing. I bought my first uh, uh, pair of bell bottoms back in, uh, in 1963. And I decided then it would be a great idea to uh, have a, someone manufacture bell bottom pants for us. So we made bell bottom pants in Philadelphia and we had things like a painter's pants that the kids wear, the surfers would wear those down the beach. And we had beautiful madras bedspreads. And I had folks um, in India start manufacturing clothing. There were daishikis, there were all kinds of wonderful works of art as far as clothing was concerned. And that's how the shop got started. So I was in that business for some 20 years. And um, what then happened was those businesses started shrinking. And what made those business shrink, a guy called uh, uh, Pier One started coming into our territories, opening up stores in the mall. And Spigiv changed their whole footprint. And their footprint, they started bringing in things like lava lamps. And I've been selling lava lamps for years. And, and we had posters. And we had Daglo posters. And we had a room in the back with beaded curtains you'd walk through. And all the Dago lights were there. We would do body painting. We would do spin art and things like that. So when a kid came to the mall, any of those malls I mentioned early on, they couldn't wait to duck their parents and head for the Ginza shop or the or one of my stores or, or around the region. And that's how that business got started. And it was very, very lucrative. And I made a lot of money doing that. So. Um, uh, I had the opportunity to do an interview with the Philadelphia Daily News back in 1964. And the lead article read, the hippie movement has, has not heard in wallet. And, and it didn't because I was selling tens of thousands of dollars worth of things. Like I went to Canada and bought a boxcar load of old fur coats. And we brought them back to uh, Long Beach Island and we piled them up on the sidewalk and we called them funky furs. And the kids, of course, back in the 60s wanted to be totally different. So um, they would come and they would buy the furs, they would buy the posters, the incense, and all those great things. So that's kind of my background uh, as far as business was concerned. And of course, I sold those businesses and, and moved on to do other things. And in 1960, 1978, Gambling was passed in Atlantic City for New Jersey. And I got a phone call from a gentleman by the name of Reese Pally. And Reese Pally knew my business background because I used to work for him as a buyer overseas. And he says, we have a problem here in Atlantic City. Uh, resorts can't get their license. They need a minority vendor. So I got the call and I came to Atlantic City and my credentials all checked out. And um, they got their license. <laughs> I got a retail establishment at Resorts International. So it was really a, a great deal for, for me and my family to open a retail store uh, in Atlantic City. The name of the store was called The Lucky Elephant. And I came up with the name because people around gambling, they wanted to be lucky. So I had the store <coughs> filled with elephants. And all the elephants had their trunk turned up and pointing the front door. And it's believed by a lot of folks that if you have an elephant with you or in your
Mr. Hunter might be just frozen for a I second. There we go. Resort International. And it was a really a great deal for me and my family because they needed me. I didn't need them. I already had a business. So um, I sat down with the leasing agent and we talked about um, me coming there and signing that lease. I said, well, great. If I sign a lease with you, it's going to be in my favor, not yours. And so the lease read that I would pay 10% rent. If I sold something for a dollar, I would pay Resorts International $10. I mean, 10 cents on every dollar. And so that lease ran for some 15 years. Of course, when that lease ended, the Resorts International couldn't wait to throw me out as quickly as they possibly could because they were getting <coughs> tens of thousands of dollars per square foot for space in the casino. So it was really, really good for us. And uh, after that was over, I decided to start furthering my collection with African-American memorabilia. I've been collecting it for, at that point, for about 30 years. It was a collection that I had started. And the reason I started collecting African-American memorabilia, uh, I had gone into an antique store in North Carolina. And when I arrived in the antique store, I asked the clerk that she have anything was African-American or black. And she said she had one item in the store and that item was in the back room and her boss didn't want her to put it out. So I said to her, Miss, I have. Just again, a note, we occasionally get these glitches. It's probably just Mr. Hunter's Wi-Fi. So he'll be back with us in just a second, I'm sure. I was one of four black kids in my class. And I remember quite vividly the teacher reading a story uh, at least once a week. And the name of the story she would tell us was called Little Black Sambo. When she would read the story, I'd take my hands and put them in my ears and never listen to any of the words because at graham cracker time, I would be Little Black Sambo. So it really, really hurt my, um, my bringing up in such a way that it scarred me in many ways that uh, people would think of me as little black sambo. So um, when the lady brings the book out of the back room, the book is a little book written by a lady by the name of Helen Bannerman. Now she wrote this book while traveling on a train with her two daughters in India. So, this, so the lady hands me this book it's a little black sambo and I'm regressing again. And um, I remember it vividly. So um, I told the lady I would buy anything that she had. So uh, I purchased the book. And as I'm walking out of the antique store, uh, I said to myself, I'm gonna buy every damn little black sambo book for the next five years and have a big bonfire and blow, burn them all the hell up. That was my thought going out of the store. But I took the book out to the car, I opened it up, and I started reading it. It was a fascinating story. It was about a little black boy in India that his mother makes him a new jacket, new pair of pants, and a new pair of slippers. And he has his father umbrella. So, so he asks his mother to go out into the jungle and play. And she says, yes, but don't go far because it's dangerous out there. So as soon as he was out into the jungle for about five minutes, oh, gosh, a tiger comes up to him and he roars at him. And he says, if you don't give me that beautiful jacket, I'm going to eat you up. He says, what are you going to do with my jacket? He says, I'm going to put it on my hind two legs. And when I walk through the jungle, I'll be the most handsome tiger in the jungle. Oh, boy. So he gives up the jacket. Now, a tiger, another tiger number two comes along and roars at him once again and says, if you don't give me those beautiful pants you're wearing, I'm going to eat you up. What are we going to do with the trousers? He says, I'm going to put on my front two legs. So when I walk through the jungle, I too will be the most handsome tiger in the jungle. Now he's all sweating and bothered. Now he gives up the pants and the jacket. Now another tiger comes to and roars once again. He says, if you don't give me those beautiful slippers, I'm going to eat you up. What are those slippers? He says, I'm going to put them on my ears. And when I walk through the jungle, I too will be the most handsome tiger in the jungle. Now little black sample has nothing but his umbrella and his undergarments on. So he's hiding behind this tree and lo and behold, another tiger comes up and 
roars at him once again. He said, if you don't give me that beautiful umbrella, I'm going to eat you up. What are you going to do with the umbrella? I'm going to put it on my tail. And when I walk through the jungle, I'll be the most handsome tiger in the jungle. Now, the tiger has his jacket, his pants. He has his slippers on his ears. Now the umbrella. So the tigers are prancing around the jungle, boasting how gorgeous they are. And all of a sudden, they start chasing each other a little faster, and then a little faster. Then they decided to take off all their clothing. And when they took off all the clothing that they had taken from Little Black Sambo, they put it alongside the tree, and then they start chasing each, all the other tigers around another tree. So they're going around this tree faster and faster, 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 faster. chasing each other, tail to nose. So they're going around this tree so fast. They started to melt. And when they started to melt, this big mound of yellow stuff came from the tigers. And it turned out that it turned into a mound of butter, tiger butter. So little Sambo sees the tiger had melted. And he gathers his clothing and he goes back home and he tells his mother what a terrible day he had in the jungle with these tigers. Mr. Hunter, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm going to ask you to pause for just a sec because your audio seems to have dropped. And it melted. We're losing contact. Oh, you're back. Go ahead. <laughs> and this mound of butter was there and his father brings it home and he asks him about his day and he tells him about the tigers. And his father said, well, what would you like to eat today? Little Black Sambo said to his dad, I can eat 100 pancakes. So the father eats like 87 and mother eats like 31 pancakes. So the moral of this whole story is how the museum actually got started. It got started because I purchased a book about Little Black Sambo. So in a collection at the museum, we have every Little Black Sambo that's been written by Helen Batterman and others have written uh, copies of that book. So that's how the collection got started. So being the first item for the museum, now we have an access of more than 13,000 items in our archives. But it all started from something. So it started from that very, very first book of Little Black Sample. So I wanted to share that with the group. We're going to have Q&A after that. So that's how I wanted to start this lecture. So folks listening and listening in the future will understand the importance of having had something happen drastic to you and taking that drastic thing and turning it in a negative into a positive. So that's how the doors got open. So we um, then had the opportunity to be at a place in Pleasantville, New Jersey, <clears throat> was showcasing some of our wares that I had collected over the years. And in that location was called Wash's Restaurant. It's located on Route 9 in, in Pleasantville, New Jersey. It no longer exists. That building now is a church. And um, that's where it got started. So a gentleman was watching, reading the newspaper the next day about uh, Ralph Hunter's collection at this location. And he read the newspaper. And the next day, I got a phone call. And a phone call was from the mayor of Buena Vista Township. His name was Chuck Chiarella. And he says, uh, I understand you have this great collection and you'd like to have a place to house it. And he says, I have this place in Newtonville, New Jersey, where if you come and meet me and the deputy mayor will meet with you and talk to you about using the walls here at the Dr. Martin Luther King Center to decorate every month, every two months, however you deem necessary. And then we'll make this one. So, we opened there in 2002. So now we're celebrating our 20th anniversary at the Dr. Martin Luther King Center in Newtonville, New Jersey.
there's this big garage and we're going to turn 15,000 square feet of it into art space. So Stockton Noise Garage is here and the Noise Museum came in and took a portion of it and they have the front of it and we have the rear of it. Um, so that's where the museum is located. We're celebrating our eighth year here at Stockton's uh, Art Garage and it's really been fantastic. kids and those youngsters and the housewives that have been painting for years but never having a spot to put their because we have an exhibit here right now today and the exhibits by a, a, an artist who was young back in 1976 he graduated from the University of Pennsylvania and, and Moore College of Art and he was a hot artist he lived down on Palton Avenue in West Philadelphia he became neighbors with the move people. So he met them, he befriended them, and he drew art about the move people. And that's what we have on display here at the African American Museum in Atlantic City now. And if you get an opportunity to buy today's Philadelphia Inquirer, is a full page article about the African American Museum of Southern New Jersey and this great exhibit. The other part of the exhibit has quilts and they are embroidered quilts of patches of African Americans that have been killed or brutally beaten on the United States of America. There's 119 people on these two quilts and it's pretty, pretty amazing. And if you get an opportunity to come to Atlantic City, it will be here at the Arch Garage until February the 26th, that exhibit will be up. And I just happen to have in my hand right now, uh, I'll probably try to show you the place uh, back in 1947 when Jackie Robinson signed the contract to play for the Brooklyn Dodgers. So that exhibits at our museum in Newtonville. And we have the history of the New York League, the history of the Brooklyn Dodgers, as well as oil paintings put together by an artist named Pat Freeman. Now he's at that location and he'll be there until the end of February. So talking about those two current exhibits that are taking place, I wanna change direction a little bit and talk to you guys about the Great Migration. Um, there was a great artist uh, who lived in Atlantic City who went on to do great work about the Great Migration. And I'm gonna not mention his name now, but I'm gonna come back and Q and A and ask you who was the great artist who was born in Atlantic City, who's world renowned, who served in the Coast Guard, give you another clue, and he went on to do great work. But his series of work was called The Great Migration. Now we're gonna flip talking about the artist, and we're gonna start talking about the great migration. What happened in the 20s, the 30s, when African Americans left the cotton fields, the tobacco fields in the South to come north for the Great Migration. And they migrated to cities such as New York City, there in Harlem. They went to places like the South Side of Chicago. They went places like Gary, Indiana, and they went all through the North to find jobs working in the hospitality in industry as chambermaids, as butlers to the very wealthy people, as part of the industrial revolution. 
the Industrial Revolution took place really throughout Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, throughout all of the Chicago area, as well as Gary, Indiana, as well as Detroit, Michigan, where the automotive industry was taking place. They worked throughout Pennsylvania in the coal mines. They worked all over the countries, but that was the better deal than working 18 hours a day, sun up to sun down, and working in the farms, working in fields. Um, my parents migrated from Mississippi and Tennessee, and they came north, and their family, part of the family was born in the south, and the other part, I was born in, in, in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. But we, too, were part of the Great Migration. So in migrating to areas like Atlantic City, New Jersey, I want to give you an overview of what took place here in Atlantic City. We'll use this as, not as a test case, but it'll be a city that acquired African Americans for their labor force. And they came here, some 30,000 of them came to Atlantic City. I'm hoping that you can see this map here of Atlantic City. Atlantic City's area had some 30,000 people of color, but they were forced to live in a self-contained community. They had them all over the United States during the Great Migration. Over here, where it's red at, is where the African Americans could buy a house, they could rent an apartment, they could rent a room. Mainly, they had rooms. But Atlantic City grew so really outstanding because it was at the union and they had black folks here working in the hotels. So a guy came here to Atlantic City in the 1930s and he opened up the first major nightclub. The major nightclub was called the Club Harlem. But prior to be the Club Harlem, it had another name. It was called Fitzgerald's. But in these self-contained communities, the African-Americans who came north, they came as part of the land of Lincoln. 90% uh, of the African-Americans who came here were forced and asked to register as Republicans to get a job. And there was a gentleman here in Atlantic City who fostered that belief. His name was Enoch Johnson. He was part of the Bork Empire. He was in politics, and he made sure that the African-Americans who came here to Atlantic City were registered Republicans to get a job working as a dishwasher, to work as a bellman, to work at any job at all in the hotel industry. You first had, I when I arrived here in the 1950s, my first boss told me I had a summer job that, uh, that I made sure if I was here in November at election time, that he would give me two hours off to go vote. I remember that like it was yesterday. So knowing what a self-contained African-American community is, they had them all over the North. But here in Atlantic City, they had entrepreneurs. They had a lady by the name of Madam Sarah Spencer Washington. Madam Washington was a multi-millionaire and she employed 4,000 people worldwide as salespeople selling her hair care products. Um, Madam Washington had a factory here in Atlantic City and her folks used to arrive here by boxcar. The Atlantic City post office had to quadruple its size just to ship her products across the country and over the world. Uh, her product's average price was between 15 cents and $10 uh, for a hair care kit. Um, and she she employed these people around the country to become salespeople, to sell hair care products in the South, all over the world, to sell her products. She became a multi-millionaire. Another multi-millionaire here in Atlantic City were people who were in the, the gambling business. They were in the numbers business, and they were in the number writing business. When I say number writing, we had a gentleman here by the name of Mr. Austin Clark, he came here from the, from the Barbados. He bought up a lot of real estate because he knew if he had real estate, 
he could rent his real estate rooms and his apartments out to people working in the hospitality industry on the boardwalk. So when the African-Americans arrived here, the first group 160 years ago, they were the people who came here who built the railroad, who built the boardwalk, who built the hotels, who worked in the hotels and they needed to live somewhere. So they lived on the north of Atlantic City and they lived, they had beautiful homes. There was a gentleman who arrived by the name by the thousands who were very well educated. They came here to Atlantic City and they had this section of town called North Side. We had some 13 African American doctors on the north side of Atlantic City. Of course, we had some 18 African American lawyers who practice on the north side. So the business was really huge. Atlantic City's north side was equivalent to Harlem, New York, but it was bigger than Harlem, New York, because in the summertime, 100,000 African Americans would come to Atlantic City for simply to be entertained at these wonderful nightclubs. I'm going to show you something here. This was called Fitzgerald's Auditorium. This is 1921. African Americans would come to Atlantic City to be entertained by entertainers who could not work at the big hotel. So they would work on the north side of Atlantic City. So Fitzgerald's became a dance hall, became a boxing gym, became a boxing arena. And people could come to Atlantic City and learn how to dance from all over the country. They could come here and learn all the steps. So if, I don't know if you could see this here, but it costs 50 cents on this night to learn a new dance. And all those are different dances that they learned. This particular poster I recently found behind a picture that was in the a frame. We had reframed, but behind it is this poster. And we're really, really delighted to know that Fitzgerald's was a major club and it was owned and operated by African Americans, which was part of the, that children's circuit. I'm going to show you another shot of. Hard Rock Casino on the 26th of February. Is anyone going to, I'm going to ask you guys after, what do you think of it, um, um, the next artist we're bringing in, um, Kurt Franklin is going to cost to see him at Hard Rock. We're sponsoring this event coming to Hard Rock on the 26th. Okay, now, now you have seen the beginning of entertainment. Now you will see what happened here in Atlantic City later on. Later on in Atlantic City, a nightclub opened there called the Club Harlem. Club Harlem is where Ella Fitzgerald played, Duke Ellington, Billy Holiday, all the major entertainers from around the world came to Atlantic City to be entertained. The name of the street was called Kentucky Avenue. Kentucky Avenue was world renowned. They came from the South. They came from all over the United States to come here to be entertained. At the Club Harlem, they had a show called The Breakfast Show. The Breakfast Show started at 6 o'clock in the morning. This was just not Blacks who came to be entertained here. 50% of the people who came here were white. They came from Margate. They came from Ventnor. They came and stayed at the hotels, but they went to see the Black entertainers. So Pop Williams, who started this nightclub, he started this nightclub in 1942. And in 1942, Pop Williams came to Atlantic City. He had just graduated from the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. He was a doctor. But when he arrived here, he found that they had 13 doctors here in Atlantic City. So he decided to change
just wanted to let you know you've frozen the money from the bank because they couldn't get any money to to remodel this beautiful building but entertainment was his forte and they would bring busloads of people and park them on Atlantic Avenue and they had a mixed crowd Sammy Davis Frank Sinatra all played the club hall every major entertainer in the United States We keep losing you, Mr. Hunter. Contract of an entertainer, whether his name was Sammy Davis or Lou Rawls, it didn't matter. Uh, they had a 50 mile range that they could not entertain if they got a contract playing at one of the hotel casinos in town. Even the Latin casino closed. Not only did the Club Harlem close, but they closed down as well because that was within that 50 mile mileage from one venue to another. So those entertainers went on to play Atlantic City. Eventually, the nightclubs in Atlantic City closed up. There were some 47 liquor licenses on the north side of Atlantic City. I'm gonna ask a question at the end of this year, how many liquor licenses do you think owned and operated by African-Americans on the north side now? I'm also going to ask you a question later on. How many number writers that were my millionaires are left in Atlantic City's North Side? And you'll find that answer, and I have a quote for that as well, what happened with that. Now, entertainment is, was, the, was the most important thing for Atlantic City, as well as cities around. Philadelphia had the, the Blue Note. They had nightclubs up and down. Uh, South Street in, in, in Philadelphia. Jazz was king. Entertainment was a very, very important part. The people worked, they got paid, and on the weekend, they wanted to be entertained. So to be in the entertainment business was really, really quite great. So today, I like to promote to you guys and tell you the story that we've partnered with the Hard Rock Casino in Atlantic City. They have an auditorium. They don't have the Club Harlem, but they have an auditorium called the Edis Arena that holds 5,000 people. We partnered with them to bring in entertainer Kurt Frank, who was an international gospel singer from Detroit. He's going to be here and he's going to fill that room up. So the point that I'm taking you on here is how the museum got started with a little black sambo book. We partnered with the folks in Ocean County Historical Society who made a wonderful donation to the museum of wonderful African-American memorabilia. We're growing more and more each and every day. To tell the story about African-American history, it just began one day when I was a little kid, when I probably read my first little Bible verse, I wanted to find out about African-American history and the origin of, of Aunt Mama, the origin of Little Black Sambo. I needed to know these things to be able to tell the story to folks at the Ocean County Historical Society and other folks around the world. It's been my pleasure and opportunity to work with Ocean County and to work with Rock. Also bringing a show at uh, it's called On Kentucky Avenue. On Kentucky Avenue is a Broadway production put together by a gentleman by the name of Adam and his wife, Jerry Wade. She sang at the club hall, and Adam Wade was an entertainer at the club hall. So what better to bring in Black History Month to Hard Rock Casino as a Broadway production of On Kentucky Avenue. That's gonna open in Atlantic City on February 18th and 19th. The Kurt Flanken show is gonna take place on February the 26th. Um, uh, I just love having this opportunity, working with the big boys, <laughs> working at telling the story about African-American history. 
Yesterday, I had a little girl. She was in the fourth grade. She came with her mother to the African American Museum. And she wanted to know, because her teacher wanted to know uh, about Dr. Martin Luther King. She wanted to know, did I know Dr. King? Have, did I ever see him? And I shook that little girl's hand. I said, this is the hand that shook Dr. King's hand. She says, mommy, I'm never going to wash it. I'm never going to wash it. <laughs> Mr. Hunter shook hands with Dr. King. Yes, I was at the March on Washington. Yes, I took photographs at the March on Washington. And it was really, really a great thing to have the opportunity to be there at the March on Washington to feel the energy of all of those people, black, white, yellow, they were all part of what took place in Washington. It was a fantastic experience for me. And I'm just delighted that I've lived these years. I just last week celebrated my 84th birthday and it was fantastic. All I wanted was a beautiful piece of banana bread <laughs> and a strawberry shortcake and my family made sure I had both. It was a great birthday and I enjoyed just being part of history. Um, in this particular gallery that we're in right now, my backdrop is Whoopi Goldberg. Whoopi Goldberg had the opportunity to sneak into the African American Room Museum unannounced with a camera. She took a picture of an exhibit called the Pettijohn family. And in 48 hours, the Pettijohn family was on national TV on The View. She enjoyed her trip here so well that she later on donated this piece of art in back of me. It's a piece of Whoopi Goldberg's art done by an artist by the name of Gal Huziri, who actually donated the piece. It's 10 foot by 10 foot. It looks like a photograph but it's not a photograph at all. It's called photo realism. It's done with a number two brush and it took more than two years to paint. So Whoopi Goldberg had this piece scheduled to go to the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, DC. She said, no, no, no. We're gonna donate that piece of art to the African American Museum because small museums need important work. The major new museums around the country have great works of art. Now at the African American Museum, we have a piece of art. That's a quarter of a million dollar work of art done by this wonderful artist, Ugal Ozeri. He's also a Jersey guy. His studios are, are up in Jersey City. It's called Manor Contemporary. It's a huge art center. It's 250,000 square feet. They have 500 artists who have major galleries there who work there. They have dance studio, they have a big film studio, they have everything you get about the arts. So if you have an opportunity there in, um, in Ocean County, take the day and go up to Manor Contemporary. Mention my name, they'll be pretty good up there. And, and take a, a day and go through that beautiful art center. It's just really, truly amazing. So we've had the opportunity to partner with, with Manor Contempt, we've met with, um, with uh, Hard Rock, we've partnered with um, Ocean County Historical Center, and we have partnerships like that around the country with this quilt that we have here. We have it on loan from, from a group in Washington State, and we're just doing wonderful things. Wonderful, wonderful. Thing. You guys think I'm getting tired yet or ready to ask my question? How long are we on now? Does anyone have a time schedule here? Yeah, so we've been going for about 45 minutes now. So we can transition to question and answer whenever you're ready. Okay, that sounds wonderful. I'm ready to transfer to question Q&A. Okay, so it sounded like you might have some questions you want to ask the audience. Do you want to ask your questions or do you want me to allow them to ask their I'm questions? Ask some questions too. So, so I want them, first of all, um, can they tell me the artist who was born in Atlantic City who created artwork, The Great Migration? 
Okay, so everyone should have the ability to unmute themselves or you are welcome to type your answer in the chat and I will read it for you. Mr. Hunter is looking for the name of the African American artist who was from Atlantic City and did work about the Great Migration. Jacob so, Lawrence. Right. Jacob, oh, from oh, the shit. Harlem Renaissance, Jacob oh, Lawrence, who, who is friends with uh, Langston Hughes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> like All right. Franklin got Thank the prize, though. He got it before me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get a Wookiee button. Are you guys old enough to know who Wendell Wookiee was? Yes. He okay. ran, Wendell Wilkie yeah. ran for president against um, Harry Truman, against <laughs> Roosevelt. Roosevelt. Yeah, Roosevelt. Roosevelt. All right. I guess you have to give them a harder one then, Mr. Hunter. Do you have a harder one? <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we talked about um, entertainment uh, at different nightclubs and around the country. See, I didn't write my questions down. I just put them in my head. And I'm trying to remember where I was at a half hour ago. Why don't we switch over to Q&A then? Okay. Let me then open it to the audience. Does anyone yes. in the audience have a question? As I noted, you can unmute yourself or if you'd like to type your question in the chat, I'll be happy to read it. Mr. Hunter, did you uh, personally, while you're going through school, I believe uh, you went to Overbrook High School in Philadelphia, if I remember, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, uh, Will Chamberlain. Um, so uh, in any case, did you encounter uh, racism as a student there? And if so, uh, did that shape your life? Your, you your know, thoughts, I, your beliefs? I never encountered racism as a child. The only thing I can remember that was racism to me was uh, when my father and his brother had a landscaping business and we worked in Frankfurt section of Philadelphia. And when we worked there, we would mow these lawns. I'm a little kid pushing a hand lawnmower. It was really, really difficult. I didn't do it but one summer and I quit that job. Um, so I would see on people's lawns, these statues, these Jocko statues, and when I would see one, I would wonder why would they sign a contract to take care of this lawn over here? And they've got this black statue on it with big red lips, with big white eyes. And he's just standing there. He's standing there. At that time, I didn't know the story of Jocko. And I will share that story. It will take about two minutes if I have that time. Yeah, okay. Yes, please, sure. go ahead. Okay. Jocko was... Um, a legend has it, Jocko was a little black boy. I suspect Mr. Hunter may be going to get something to illustrate his point. This here is a, a salesman sample of Jocko. This would be a normal statue, would be about three foot tall. Legend has it, Jocko was a little black boy and he was a slave for General Washington. And when General Washington came to the Battle of Trenton in New Jersey, Jocko's job was to hold the horses on the Pennsylvania side of the Delaware. On that Christmas Eve, it was so cold, Jocko froze to death in this position holding the horses, legend has it. Hmm. When General Washington returned back to Pennsylvania, he saw that his slave had frozen to death and he summons a blacksmith in to make a statue of him and his likeness. And he put it in the safe house they would light this lantern with an oil lamp. And if it was lit, it meant it was the safe house to come to that night. And if it was not lit, it meant go hide in the woods. And when the African-Americans would go, the runaway slaves would run, hide in the woods, they would sing to amuse themselves. And that's where one of the great spirituals came from. Wait in the water, wait in the water, till and wait. Legend of Jocko. I'll take the next question. 
Sever, are you there? Do we have another question? Oh. Mr. Oh. Hunter, you asked us uh, how many liquor licenses on the north side are owned currently by African Americans. Thanks for and, making uh, it. I, I'd be curious how many. I have no idea. Well, at that one point, it was more than 40. Yeah. Um, today, there is zero. Mm. One liquor license. And oh, did we lose Ralph again? In African American communities around the country. Answer zero. Because what happened. The feds came in and locked up all the number writers and put them in jail. Then they went into business. They went into the lottery business. Now ask me how many lottery machines are on the north side of Atlantic City in a store owned and operated by a black person. And the answer to that is zero. There's not one state lottery machine on the north side of Atlantic City in a store and it's owned and operated by a person who looks like me. Hmm. Why is that? Well, we had 20 number bankers here. There were millionaires, these guys. So what happens now that the lottery machine took place of the number writer, those dollars that stayed in the African-American community no longer stay in the community. Once they go to the state house, those dollars come back in drips and drops. Hmm. I want to share that point with you. Mm -hmm. So now you know about the liquor license. Now you know about the numbers business. Hmm. Okay. Why aren't they able to have lottery uh, machines in the north uh, part? What, why are they keeping them away from African American stores? because African-Americans don't own the stores anymore. At one time, we owned all the stores. We were forced to own the stores because that's what was the corner store where you went to, you played your number, and that was it. Now, African-Americans only own, only operate four basic businesses in the traditional African-American community, whether it's, a, whether it's in South Side of Chicago, whether it's in Gary, Indiana, or whether it's in Newark, New Jersey, or whether it's in Harlem, New York. There's only four basic businesses that still survive today that are owned and operated by African-Americans. At one time, they owned all of the businesses. Can what anyone are the what four businesses you think? Now, Jeff, you can't tell because you were in my class. <laughs> there's, only, there's only four basic businesses that survive around this whole country in a traditional African-American city. There's only four businesses that survive in those communities around the country. Does anyone have any idea what those four basic businesses are? Barbershops? Barbershops are one, yes. So what's the opposite of a barbershop? Beauty, uh, Beauty uh, you, you have two or four. Now, can you help me with the last two? I'll give a little hint. One of them, though, really, Ms. Uh, Ralph, is not really a business per se, it's right? It's an institution. Yeah. It's an institution. Okay. That's what? Institution. Uh, uh, funerals? That's three. Now you go to the institution. Funeral home. Because if you're African-American, you're born and raised African-American, that's what you're going to be until you die. So generally, 90% of the time, a black funeral director will be the one officiating over your body. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if you move out of the African American community and move to a very wealthy $300,000, $400,000 house in a suburban area, you're still going to come back and be buried by that black funeral director. You're still going to come back and get your hair done by the black beauty beautician. You're still going to get your hair cut by a black barber. So How about the, churches? That's the last one, yes. The black church still survives. The lottery machine's not here. 
but the black church is still surviving. Hmm. Yes. So. How many churches, how many black churches are in Atlantic City? Same amount that were here when they were well, 100 years ago. There's almost um, 30 of them, 30, wow. 30, 31, 32. We're doing a new exhibit on the black church. And when we, we're, that's going to be at uh, Hard Rock. We're creating a new, to tell the history of the black church, how it got started at Mother Bethel Church in Philadelphia, and how the branches came off of that. <laughs> so um, the church has not changed. The only thing that's changed is the church are the pastors and congregations have shrunk. Yeah. And they've been shrinking more with um, the on Zoom church. The, I, was, I was at 10 churches this morning, by the way, wow. promoting uh, Kurt Franklin coming to Atlantic City and promoting the new thing about Kaaba. I would visit 10 churches. I must have went through um, 400 pamphlets this morning. And I'll do another 10 next Sunday. And we're doing them in Camden County. We're doing them in Burlington County and in Ocean County. Uh, I have one other question for you, Ralph. Oh, go ahead. Beg your pardon. Oh. I was going to say, I'd like to hear from some of the youngsters if any of those are unmuted. I think they're all muted. They do all have the ability to unmute themselves. Perhaps they're just feeling a little shy. I note again that if you, anyone has a question, you can type it in the chat and I will gladly read it for you. Or perhaps they're all getting ready to go and okay. visit the museum. <laughs> yeah, I, I welcome each and every one out there in my in the listening audience to do put it on your to do list to visit the African American Museum, either here in Atlantic City or in Newtonville, or you can visit the National African American Museum in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. Go visit. Take your children. Take your grandkids. Let them know first on. The only way you're going to really, really know and appreciate African American history is to talk to a guy like me or to talk to someone in one of the other museums. Uh, we lived it, we felt it, we sleep it, we eat it each and every day. Uh, what you get from me will be nothing but the truth about my life, about the lives of people I've studied, about the lives of people I've researched. Um, it's, it, it's really, really quite interesting to get it from someone who looks like me. Mr. Hunter, um, how can we as a historical society work closer with the African-American community here in Ocean County? My, my first thought would be to find a history teacher at school, and you have lots of, we're gonna be at your school pretty soon. Um, find a history teacher who likes teaching, not just American history, African-American history is American history. And don't ever forget that. That's all part of the curriculum. Um, but it's changed. When I was in school, we didn't get African-American history. We got a little black sambo when we talked about that. <laughs> but I think you yeah. can reach out to the clergy. I think a lot of educators or leaning more and more toward the church. Um, you'll probably find uh, principals in your school system or assistant principals or, or uh, janitors or anyone in your school system is connected to a church. And I think if you can find a way to lean a little bit to the church is in your communities, as well as your history teachers, you're gonna find a way to filter into that community. I think that the young kids today have a way of understanding through the computer. That's why they're all muted right now. <laughs> they're listening, but they're not saying anything. They're taking it in. I think you, you and your organization should reach out to small community groups. Find someone at the, uh, at the baseball game. Find someone at the gym. Find someone at the grocery store and tell them about the service that you're providing and make them part of it. My question to you guys, I think you need to recruit an African-American and get them on your board. Yeah. Um, I think it's rare. We have people that are non-African-American on our board, 
So I think if you have an African-American on your board, I think it, it kind of gentrifies your organization. I concur with that statement. Okay. Hey, um, Josh, did you have any closing remarks you want to make before we bring this program to an end? Jeff, sure any last comments from you, Jeff, as our president, before we start to wrap up? Oh, no, it was wonderful. Uh, Melissa, Barb, uh, Mickey, Richard, thank you so much, as always. Um, we look very much forward to seeing you, Ralph, on uh, a, a Wednesday at High School South. And uh, just so you know, uh, we do, uh, we are very big on diversity and moving forward. We do have a plan in place to take many of your leads and to start implementing them. But thank you for a, a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And I did it without notes. How did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> that was excellent. Thank you so much, Mr. Hunter. There was a request that I put the links to the museum in the chat. So those are there if anyone wants them. Or of course, you know, you could find them via Googling, but they're right there in the chat for you if you need them. We hope you can all get down to visit Mr. Hunter's museum soon. And, any and any get, last remarks from you? Yeah, get the today's Philadelphia Inquirer. Oh. All right, so everybody, right, that's I'm, your homework. I get today's knew, Philadelphia knew, Inquirer. I never knew the paper cost $5. <laughs> I, I had to buy five of them. <laughs> 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 All right, well thank then. You thank you for having me. And I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. Yeah, take care now. Bye -bye. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you everyone for joining us. Have a nice day. Veda, can you sign me off? Thank you.